Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I am uh, Liza Gross, the Executive Director of the International Women's Media Foundation. And this is a totally outstanding crowd. What a strong contingent. Lots of folks from the faculty and student uh, group of the School of uh, Media and Public Affairs of GW. <laughs> Distinguished journalists from the uh, Washington community. Uh, from, with my limited eyesight, I can see Marvin Kalb over there. <laughs> I can see Marcus Broccoli over there from the Washington Post. I see Michelle Salcedo, president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists over there. Thank you for coming. And of course, our delegates. Um, our delegates to uh, the International Conference of Women Media Leaders convened by the International Women's Media Foundation. This particular activity exemplifies our collaboration, the success of our collaboration with the George Washington University, our partner in this conference. But our work, we know, would not be possible without partners like this and without the support of our generous sponsors. I will quickly name them. Never, never enough thanks. John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, Bank of America, Bloomberg, McCormick Foundation, Goldman Sachs, 10,000 Women, and Gibson Dun and Crutcher LLP. This conference and its programming emphasizes the importance of diversity in the media industry. We recognize global regions and countries within those regions. They have different challenges, they have different needs, and operate with different methodologies. This presentation today by the Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism, The State of the News Media 2011, offers a picture of what is going on here in our United States of America. Before we go into the study, I'd like to welcome the California Viewing Party, which is organized by Christine Bronstein and Kimberly Pinkson, members of the IWMF's steering committee, West Coast. Kimberly, Christine, if you can hear me, if you can see me, hi, hi. <laughs> now, um, Tom Rosenstiel, Director of the Project for Excellence in Journalism, and Frank Cessna, Director of GW School of Media and Public Affairs, will examine the findings of the study. I am delighted to turn the microphone over to Frank Cessna. Thank you very much, Liza. I think uh, one thing is clear that Liza doesn't have enough enthusiasm for the group. There's not enough energy there. So Liza, perhaps we'll get you an extra cup of coffee and help you along. No, it is a great, great pleasure on behalf of the School of Media and Public Affairs and everyone at the George Washington University to welcome Liza and uh, all of the delegates uh, to the International Women's Media Foundation here to campus. We salute you and your work and your courage uh, on all fronts, uh, but in particular from the, the parts of the world uh, from which many of you come where just getting to work and doing your job and reporting the news uh, contains elements of danger and risk and you are doing an incredible job every day. So may I start please by recognizing all of the delegates from around the world. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, we like to say at the School of Media and Public Affairs that we are the crossroads of media and politics. We offer undergraduate uh, degrees to our students in both journalism and in political communication. That looks at both how we communicate, and the media through which we communicate, and the impact that has on our political process, and how the political process and the media connect and, and, and both the citizens and those who are governing. It's a fascinating way to come at this issue, a fascinating way to look at the media, and I think very relevant to all of us here today and to the conversation um, that, is to, that is to follow. These are truly remarkable times in the events that we're trying. I spent years at CNN. I cannot imagine a news diet like the one we're living on right now where we are tracking multiple disasters, multiple upheavals, remarkable global economic uh, uh, shifts, tectonic shifts in technology and the way ideas and people and goods travel around the world. So what a timely uh, moment to come together. And in the world of journalism and media, 
Um, well, we hope change is good because there sure is enough of it. <laughs> um, and we're going to hear today from someone who's tracked that change in a remarkable, a remarkable way. Um, the Project for Excellence in Journalism is our window into the industry. And uh, the research and, and, and the uh, examinations that they conduct, the conversations that they conduct throughout all media really uh, provide tremendous insight as to what is happening, where, what is unfolding, and I think where the future, to some extent, we'll let Tom go into this, where the future lies. Their 2011 uh, report was released just last week. Um, some of their key findings are remarkable. Here's one of the things they said. By several measures, the state of the U.S. news media improved in 2010. A quote, after two dreadful years, most sectors of the industry saw revenue begin to recover. That's hopeful. Cutbacks in most newsrooms eased. Eased, not stopped, but eased. Some experiments with new media, new uh, revenue models began to show signs of blossoming. That's hopeful. Among the major sectors, only newspapers, sorry, Marcus, only newspapers suffered continued revenue declines last year. Um, but here's what Tom and his team wrote that's most fascinating. The biggest issue ahead may not be lack of audience or even lack of new revenue experiments. It may be that the digital realm, the news industry, that in the digital realm, the news industry is no longer in control of its own future. Well, there's something to think about and we'll have an opportunity to do that. Um, I want to thank, again, the IWMF. I want to thank uh, GW for helping us pull this together. I want to thank Mike Friedman and the Global Media Institute, which has done such a remarkable job at uh, hosting all of this and, and all of you and bringing this partnership together. So thanks to Mike as well. I also want to acknowledge our viewing party in California, and I hope the party is going great. So we'll be hearing from you as well. Um, let me explain what's going to happen here. I'm going to invite Tom Rosenstiel up to talk to you for a few minutes. Then we'll invite our panelists up. I will introduce them. We'll speak with them for a few moments. And then I am going to bring myself and a microphone and plunge down onto the floor and welcome your comments, your observations, and your questions for our panelists. So the idea here is to really make this a conversation uh, amongst uh, as many of you as possible and those who are participating, these remarkably smart people who are participating in this conversation. We know that we have a wonderful mix in the audience today of uh, accomplished uh, women executives and media professionals from all over the world, of our incredibly wonderful students here at GW, our incredibly wonderful faculty who research and work in this realm. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation that we'll have. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Rosenstiel. Tom is the director of the Project for Excellence in Journalism, uh, and he is a great friend. Uh, but he's also somebody who has made a singular contribution uh, to journalism, to our understanding of where this industry is going, uh, the challenges that we're up against, and uh, the prospects that lie ahead. So without further ado, Tom Rosenstiel, it's yours. Thank you, Frank. Um, what a great group, and uh, what a nice room, light. Probably can't see the slides, but uh, just suggest that what I'm going to tell you is a little dim. The future is dim. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, say a couple of things about this annual report. Uh, it's something that we've done now for eight years. Uh, and when we started, it was the first time that anybody had tried to look across different media sectors. Usually this data was scattered across uh, uh, thousands of different places because each industry tried to uh, track itself to sell advertising and aggregate its audience, but it wasn't set up to try and understand things sociologically about where uh, media consumption and media behavior was uh, changing. Uh, the other thing I should say is that um, when we started doing it, uh, the idea that, you, that uh, there was something new to report every year seemed doubtful back in 2004. Things didn't change that rapidly in the news business, we thought. Uh, now, eight years into it, we're thinking that 
annual is too slow because you can't keep up with things that, I mean, things are, a lot of people are in this space and are trying to figure things out and, and, and there's new stuff coming out every, every week. Um, the third thing I wanted to tell you before we get to the myths is that uh, I'm just the front man uh, for this group. There's a, a, a team of uh, about 10 people who work on this report and 23 at the project altogether. Uh, many of them are at this back table here on the, uh, uh, on the left and there's some scattered uh, elsewhere and um, I basically just kind of put a little polish on, on uh, on the top of the table, uh, but they built it. Um, when we were trying to figure out how to uh, do a short presentation to touch some of the highlights, Frank and I were puzzling over how do you, you know, talk about uh, uh, eight different media sectors, even trying to describe the digital realm as uh, become impossible. Um, so we decided to do a, a, uh, the idea of myths, uh, which is a little bit of a gimmick, but a way of uh, attaching um, some um, organizing principles around some things. So we're going to talk about five uh, things that we think you, where am I pointing? Here or there? Press. Just press it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we're going to talk about five things that we think you might believe about the uh, news industry and media that are, are not true. The first one is that the problem facing traditional journalism is that it's losing its audience. Not so. Uh, online, and Matt Hinman, who's uh, going to be on the panel, is one of the pioneers in, in understanding this stuff. Uh, online, traditional media is uh, holding on to its audience, by and large. Uh, the newspaper industry, which is the most distressed of all the sectors, uh, has hung on to almost all of its audience, and some newspapers, such as the New York Times, uh, can uh, fairly argue that their audience is larger than it's ever been. In fact, that after um, two generations of audience loss, the internet has allowed newspapers to grow their audience for the first time. Um, the top 25 websites are all either aggregators of traditional media or our legacy uh, news sources. The one exception in that list of the top 25 is Huffington Post, which can argue that it's a significant uh, creator of new content. But my supposition, my hunch is that a large part of their traffic growth comes from their aggregation of traditional media, not people going to, to read Rob Reiner's blog on politics. <clears throat> I can't prove that. Matt might have data. The problem facing legacy media is a revenue problem. In the digital world, advertisers no longer need the news the way they once did to reach their audience. And uh, in the legacy media, particularly in newspapers, the advertising structure has collapsed as a result. 75% of the classified advertising that existed in newspapers in the year 2000 is gone. Gone. Disappeared into free space such as Craigslist. And while online ad revenue in 2010 surpassed print ad revenue for the first time, reaching $26 billion, only a fraction of that online advertising goes to news. We estimate, I would guess, somewhere around 15%. Consider this, the newspaper industry probably earned $22.8 billion in print ad revenue last year and only 3% in online ad revenue, even though roughly half the audience is now online. The second myth, sliding in there, this myth must be powerful because it's only three words. Content is king. We've all believed that. And when The Daily came out a couple months ago, people said, you know, it's interesting, it's attractive, but I don't know if the content is there. Content is king. Well, as Frank alluded to, I think it's possible that in the future uh, that may no longer be true. That it may be, uh, it may be knowledge about audience behavior that's king, rather than content that attracts that audience. In the 20th century, media flourished because the press was the intermediary that uh, industry needed to reach the public. They had the material that people wanted. So if you wanted to if you wanted to reach a large audience, you'd go to the networks or you'd go to the newspaper in town to reach that audience. 
it is increasingly, in the 21st century, it's increasingly technology companies who build the digital devices that we use or the software that we use to use those devices who control access to the audience. The key notion about web economics that people are talking about, which may be, which may be at the root of things like the Huffington Post AOL merger, is that the web eliminates the inefficiency in advertising, that each ad and each piece of content will be targeted to fit the consumer based on where, knowing where that consumer has been, what they've looked at, uh, their likes, their dislikes, the things they've clicked, where they live, et cetera, et cetera. That knowledge, which goes beyond news, increasingly will reside with companies that make the devices, such as Apple or the companies that develop the software systems that we use, such as Google, or who aggregate content across the web and know where we're looking, such as Google again, or the social networks where we freely tell them, I like this, I don't like this, I'm contacting this person, these are all my friends, et cetera, et cetera. They are acquiring substantial amounts of knowledge about people, and that's the commodity that will allow this targeting to take place. They know far more about the consumer than the content creator uh, of one place or one uh, outlet uh, who's got a, a significant audience, but it's only one of the audiences that's going through that device. That's why the big battle over the iPad is not so much how much uh, uh, of the revenue is Apple going to take. Is it going to be 30 percent or 40 percent or 20 percent? It's who owns the customer? Whose customer are you? On an iPad, you're Apple's customer. The third myth is that hyperlocal is the future. Local news is everything. That's where people go. That's where they get most of their news. And this idea, the notion of hyperlocalism, was certainly very popular, very powerful about five years ago. Um, the idea there was that uh, what you could, what you, what was powerful on the web was what you had that was unique, that uh, people couldn't find uh, anywhere else. That if the content you, you produced was something that was uh, uh, your brand franchise uh, that you would be protected. Um, that first iteration of hyperlocalism, we declare in the report this year, has failed. The problem with hyperlocal is twofold. First, producing hyperlocal news is very expensive. You have to, it, it costs just as much to produce a story from a small suburb as it does to to produce a story that uh, the whole region would want to read, but the appeal of that particular uh, local story is going to be more limited. Uh, so it's expensive to produce at a time when newsrooms are shrinking. The second problem is that many of the local advertisers uh, uh, who, you, who, uh, who will work with hyper-local content are not online. Um, so you've got content that is necessarily limited in its, in its appeal, and an advertising community that is uh, the least likely to be uh, connected. Um, we're now entering the second phase of hyperlocal, which is that micro sites, small community sites, are trying to focus on new revenue models that are self-sustaining, but they aren't here yet. They aren't there yet. And for the most part, we conclude that the whole sphere of local and local news is still up for grabs. Search doesn't isn't particularly great for local. If you type in to a Google search and you want to find out what's the best place to buy sneakers in your little town, it's not going to be there. The thing that drives to the top of a Google search is stuff that's national and international. Um, and the way to do local news in a way that is sustained and that is in a way that attracts an audience that you can market still hasn't been worked out. Patch is very interesting. You take the advantages of hyper-local content with the a power of a, of a, of a national uh, 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 parent. Uh, can, is that a way to solve this problem of, of, of things being, uh, of having limited appeal? We will see. It's not there yet. Um, I think some patch sites are expecting to, to be profitable uh, this year. But as much as the web has emerged after 15 years as something that is controlled by a few large companies, contrary to what many predicted, we ha that hasn't happened yet in local. It's another, it's still a place of opportunity and challenge. Uh, many of the mistakes that traditional media made over the last 15 years, they could replicate those mistakes in local news again. 
The fourth myth is that newspapers are dying everywhere. It has to be, right? I mean, what, why would uh, newspapers be thriving in some places than others? We have a report this year in the report, uh, in the study, that looks at newspapers around the world. And we wanted to mention it today because of this audience. It's not true. Over the last five years, newspaper uh, circulation is actually up worldwide. Uh, and the reason is that the factors that drive the health of newspapers have to do with uh, how wired a, a country is and, and what's going on with the population. Essentially, this generalization holds true, that in the developed world, newspapers are beginning to are suffering. And in the developing world, they are thriving. If your population rate is growing and your literacy rates are rising, print newspapers are a technology that suddenly new populations have access to. They can suddenly read for the first time. And they don't have wireless devices, they're not on the internet, um, but they can read and they can, and they can have access to a newspaper. What we're seeing in places in certain countries in Latin America, in, in India, certain countries in Asia, uh, is what we saw in the United States a hundred years ago when new immigrants would learn English, uh, would be able to read a newspaper, and they would carry it around and it would be a form of status to say, look, he can read. He can read in English. Um, that's still happening around many parts of the world. Where we see newspapers suffering is in Europe uh, and in, 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 the, in more developed countries, but American newspapers, U.S. newspapers are suffering more than any other. And the reason for that is simple. American newspapers rely on advertising for more of their revenue than newspapers anywhere else. 80, 75 to 80 percent of the revenue to American newspapers comes from advertising. It is closer to 40 to uh, 60 percent uh, in other countries. Um, and the collapse of the advertising structure that we were talking about before has hit American newspapers uh, harder and faster. But that cycle, it may well be that we are simply ahead on that cycle and that, that we uh, here indicate where the rest of the world is heading. And now our last myth. Tablets don't do anything that you can't already do with other technology. So what's the big deal about the iPad? I mean, they're expensive. They cost 500 bucks unless you want the Motorola one, and that's, I think, 800 bucks. Um, and, uh, you know, you can touch it, so isn't that cool? Um, what, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal appears to be a couple of things. First of, first of all, uh, uh, tablets are growing faster than any new technology that we've seen in the digital age. We, d we did a survey in September, and then we did another survey in, in uh, uh, January. In, Jan in September, 4% of Americans had a tablet, in January, 7% of Americans had a tablet. It had almost doubled in, in five months. Uh, and uh, other surveys that are, that are about to come out that we, that we didn't do suggest the number may now be close to 10%. In January, there was basically only one tablet out still, the iPad. In the course of this year, there'll be a number of other products uh, from other companies released. Um, wireless is very powerful. We have a survey in the study that suggests that 47% of American adults now get local news on a mobile device of some kind. 84% um, of Americans have a cell phone, and two-thirds of them use their cell phone for something more than making phone calls. Uh, the fact that you have news at your fingertips uh, at, any, at any moment is potent. Uh, and I don't think that there is any uh, limit necessarily to where this is going to go. If we're a country that likes to uh, uh, go to restaurants without having to get out of the car to eat, um, <laughs> the convenience of this device as a news acquisition uh, system I think is incalculable. And the early, very early data suggests that people are adapting to this. Um, now, there's a great hope among news companies that this is a second bite at the apple, excuse the pun, for charging for content. Whether that is true or not, I think remains to be seen. Our research suggests in the report that 11% uh, of adults have, have downloaded some kind of app, but only 10% of those have actually paid for an app, a news app. That's 1% of the population. 
There may be some elasticity here. We also asked people a hypothetical question. If your local newspaper were to die, uh, if you didn't pay for it, would you be willing to pay an online subscription? And even though the, the numbers who are doing that at this point are, and there's a couple of different studies that suggest about 1%, 23% said in, this, in the survey to this hypothetical question that they would be willing uh, to pay online. I grew up in California, and in the 1960s, we had a referendum for something that we called pay TV. Um, and uh, it went on a statewide ballot, and it lost. A lo it lost in a landslide. People didn't want to have to pay for TV. It was free. Well, uh, here we are 40 years later, and. Uh, uh, the marketplace had a different verdict. Uh, we all pay for TV. I pay an ungodly amount. I paid it last night. I couldn't believe it. Why couldn't we just vote on this and leave it at that? Thank you.